Good evening. evening. So if you turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31, verses 29 through 34. So in Jeremiah 31 here, this is what's commonly um, talked about as the the new covenant, the promise of the new covenant, which um, later on in the message tonight is going to come into play. So starting here in verse 39 of Jeremiah 31, in those days, they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful for the promise of the new covenant. Lord, we're thankful for uh, the reality of it that we have in our own hearts as uh, believers in the New Testament era. Father, we're thankful for these things. We're thankful for uh, the transformation of the heart. Father, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit. Lord, and we're also we're thankful for the ordinances as well, for the Lord's table and for baptism. Lord, guide us as we continue our study this evening that we may better understand and have a higher view, have a biblical view of what baptism really is, what it means, and how it is to be applied, Father, in a way that would honor you and that would honor your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, by way of brief review, we have seven points that we're working through as we continue on our journey through baptism, and we covered three last week. So the first point last week, we defined what baptism was, just the simple definition of the word. The second point we covered last week was we looked at the origins of baptism. We looked at extra biblical sources, such as proselyte baptism or also ritual cleansings that happened kind of in that period between Malachi and Matthew, those 400 years. Um, We looked at John's baptism, the biblical origins, and how that is not connected with proselyte baptism. The link that's often made between those two is new, it's recent, the historical and biblical data are just not there to support that connection. John's baptism is divine, it's from heaven as Jesus himself um, testified based upon his question. Uh, We also, the third point we looked at was the biblical model and teaching of baptism specifically in the New Testament. Right, so we looked at John the Baptist. How did he baptize? What did he baptize for? Right? He had a baptism that was by immersion for the forgiveness of sins. Right? It was a baptism of repentance. We also looked at how John's baptism was an initiation into the kingdom of God that was coming, that he was proclaiming, that Jesus himself was proclaiming as well. We looked at some of the, uh, the apostles, their teaching in Acts on what baptism was, Peter at Pentecost, Uh, We briefly touched on some of the various mentions in the epistles um, as well in Paul's writings, right? We also talked about the proper recipients of baptized. Who should be baptized, right? We came to the conclusion that it should be believers who are baptized. We looked at those five points that John Gill lays out in his um, body of divinity that he wrote. And then we also, and we will look at this more tonight, of how baptism ties into the entrance of the church. So now we have four points that we're going to cover tonight. We're going to look at the fourth point. We're going to look at baptism in church history. So how has baptism changed throughout the ages, the last 2,000 years of church history? Uh, the fifth point, we're going to look specifically at the reformers' work on baptism. So what is, the, what is the classic reformed view on baptism? Specifically, that would be infant baptism. And we're going to look at how that came about and also the arguments for that. So that's our fifth point. Our sixth point that we're going to look at is we are going to work on refuting briefly the different arguments and um, 
that a pedo baptist would use to defend infant baptism right so when we use the word pedo baptist pedo coming from infant right baptist is baptism so infant baptism and then the other word is credo baptism credo coming from confession so either being baptized based on your confession we are we are credo baptists in this church or you're baptized as an infant which would be pedo baptist right so those are the words that you'll see floating around or if you're reading books or listening to messages on these types of things so specifically things that we're going to look at uh, some of these you might be familiar with this might be new to a lot of you um, as well we're going to look at covenant theology right the covenant of grace the continuity of the people of god covenant signs and also the household principle that gets used and then our seventh and last point is we're going to answer all the fun practical questions about baptism like who should who should be doing the baptizing does it have to be a pastor could it be somebody else could it be the father of a household could it be a cousin well who can baptize how should it be done so should it be done in immersion what about a river what about a lake what about a pool right what about those things right so i mean these are questions that come up when should it be done right so should it be done at the start of the service at the end of the service in the middle these all the trust me all these things have split churches before so we're going to talk about them um, as silly as it may sound how long to wait that's a big one how long should you wait after you're converted before you're baptized what does baptism have to do with communion what does baptism have to do with membership and should we accept baptisms from other churches as well so those are some of the practical things that we're going to look at, um, at covering our seventh point so starting with our fourth point baptism throughout church history so we can already rule out right away that historically in the past 2,000 years um, baptizing adults based on a profession of faith has not been the majority view for 2,000 years okay that's just not the case historically that's just that's the way it is the the vast majority of church history at least for the first 1500 years um, was baptizing infants they were baptizing babies so we're gonna look at when that started because I do think we can trace historically when that started and why that started right so that's the the first thing that we're gonna look at so we'll also move into around the 1500s to the Reformation period we'll look at the Anabaptists right they were some of the people who were put to death for deciding to baptize believers and baptize adults called Anabaptists because Anna just means re and Baptist is baptism so they're rebaptizers is what they were called because they were giving uh, a second baptism so starting out in in the first century well the first century writings were the New Testament which I would argue defend adult baptism so there's our first reference uh, to adult baptism obviously that would be that's contested by um, Pado Baptist but nonetheless so the first century we're just talking about the writings of Scripture right which we've already covered to a degree so moving on to the second century um, so the second and third centuries we we have writings from early Christians but they're not we don't have a ton of writings and also what we do have is not always deeply theological the reason for that being is in the second and third century if you're remembering back in just general history right Rome is ruling and at that point Rome was not a Christian Empire Rome did not necessarily love the Christians and they were persecuted very heavily right when you're fleeing for your life um, you're really not sitting down in your house and writing systematic theology books right? it's just not what you do right because you're fleeing for your life as a Christian I mean these people are and we'll talk about this next week as we cover communion as well these people are they're giving their lives just to gather to partake of the Lord's table Right. So we're going to talk about the importance of in church history as well next week of the communion in the Lord's table and how that's changed. Um, so we don't have a ton of writings, but what we do have specifically in the second century. Now, if remembering centuries, the, the first century would be right. That would be AD zero to ninety nine. The second century, therefore, would be one hundred to one ninety nine. Sometimes that gets confused. We think of second century. We think of the two hundreds, um, but it's a little, it's flipped there. So in the second century, we're going to look at three primary sources. Right, we're, we're going to look at the, the Didache, right? We're going to look at Justin Martyr's first apology, which it's not that he's apologizing. It's not the first apology letter he ever wrote, but apology as defending the faith. And we're going to look at um, Aristides' apology as well, right? You may not have heard these people. Maybe you have. Uh, but these are the primary works that we have in the second century that discuss baptism, right? So starting with the Didache. The Didache is an early work. We have no idea who wrote it. It's... I mean, they said that this is essentially a summary of what the apostles taught, 
uh, and they give a lot of different instructions. And they give some interesting things about baptism. They're very clear on baptism, right? They're clear that it's supposed to be done in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It also is supposed to be done in running water, in a river. They say if you can't baptize in running water, then it's okay, I suppose, to baptize in still water. And if you can't baptize in cold water, then I suppose it's okay to do it in warm water, right? This is just one of the early church works. This is, this is how they did baptism. The other interesting thing is their baptismal candidates and the church were supposed to fast for one to two days before the baptism ceremony took place. So in this second century, it seems common practice that those who were getting baptized and the church would fast and pray for a day to two before their baptism. Now, is it wise to have an infant of a month old to fast for two days? No. Does this seem like it would fit with infant baptism? No. Right? And they were also giving a period of time to teach the baptismal candidates as well. So it's clear that within this very early work that was the whole point of it was to govern pretty much church services, how we ought to act as a church, was very clear. They leave no room for infant baptism and they clearly are discussing uh, different things that would only apply to baptizing believers. Right? So that's a very important thing. And then the second thing, Justin Martyr's work, talks about those to be baptized were those believers. They're supposed to fast and pray for the remission of past sins, right? And the only proper candidates were those um, who have chosen Christ and who have, and that have repentance. Those who were illuminated by, illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Those were his categories for who should be baptized. Also, not supporting infant baptism, right? The other apology letter, not by Justin Martyr, but by Aristides, after, he stated, essentially, after children believed, they were considered part of the church, right? So after they had faith, they were considered part of the church, not if they were baptized, right? Which would leave no room for infant baptism as well, right? And even infant Baptist scholars, they do admit that there is no direct evidence for infants being baptized in the first two centuries of church history, right? They admit that that wasn't commonplace, if it did happen in the New Testament, it wasn't commonplace, and they also admit that in the second century, there's no direct reference to it as well. So we can conclude, at least in the first two centuries, that immersion of believers was the common practice. Right? So then going into the third century, this is where infant baptism starts to come in to the church, right? in the third century. So this is year 200 to 299. So we're going to look at Tertullian, Hippolytus, Cyprian, and Origen. So Tertullian... When he spoke about baptism, he was giving his work, he's giving an alternative to infant baptism. Right? He specified, he talked about the simplicity of immersion, right? And that the one that was baptized was expected to live the Christian life. He talked about the baptismal candidate was to spend time in prayer, right? This the baptism was supposed to be a beginning point of obedience to the commands of Christ. Um, he also connected the how baptism helps you in your faith, and he looked at Christ. He said, look, Christ was baptized. He was given the Holy Spirit, right, descended like a dove out of heaven. And then what happened in the next chapter, in Matthew chapter 4? Well, the temptation. So he, he makes an, an interesting argument that just as Christ was able to withstand the temptation of the devil after he's baptized, so we will be able to withstand temptation after our baptism as well. But he only leaves room for adults to be baptized. So Hippolytus, the other guy, also talks about a three-year delay from conversion to baptism in order to teach uh, the children, in order to teach the adults, um, the kind of the tenets of the faith and how the church works. So now we're starting to see a span in between conversion and baptism. Now Cyprian, he affirms infant baptism. And there is specifically in Africa, which used to be a stronghold for Christianity, um, some of the, the earliest theology for the first four or five centuries came out of North Africa. Um, and some of the most um, transform or transforming theology as well. But anyways, there's a synod in 253 that declared that we should baptize babies in our churches. Now, if a church is holding a, a gathering to decide something, that means there's disagreement. So that also still shows in the third century, at least the mid-third century, that people are disagreeing about baptism, and then this church in Africa decided that, well, we should side on the infant bapti baptism side. So it wasn't widespread and it wasn't agreed upon at this point. And then Origen of Alexandria, who, he's an interesting person. He, he had a scribe follow him everywhere he went and write down every word that he said for many years of his life. So they're still translating some of his works. You could spend your whole life just reading Origen, just this one guy, 
Because somebody, I mean, think about that. What if somebody followed you all the time and wrote down everything you said? So anyways, every, take what Origen says with a grain of salt. But he said that it was widespread practice since the beginning of the apostolic church to baptize infants, at least in his area, right? Now, whether what he's saying is historically accurate, remember, the guy had it, everything he ever said was written down. So he wasn't necessarily a church historian, but he does make that claim. But we see in the third century, infant baptism is starting uh, to work its way into the church. And the reason for it was that if we're thinking of when a baby is born, we as humans are born into sin, right? We have an original sin. We have the sin of Adam on our behalf. So their thought process was in the third and fourth century, we see if an infant is sick and is about to die, we should baptize them in order to wash away that original sin. Okay, that's the idea that's starting to come in. A lot of these people, they held to adult baptism, but they said in the case of a sick infant, we'll baptize them just to err on the safe side. So that original sin is dealt with. Because just like a lot of people today, we don't really know what to do um, when, when infants die suddenly. That was an issue back then as it is an issue today. And there's still debates today within Christian circles of what happens. Are all babies going to heaven or only some? Or what does that look like? Right? So that some of these debates are still happening today. But it's that type of situation in which this is coming into it. So it starts with a, a good heart. These people care about the infants and they want to make sure they're in heaven. So they're giving them essentially the sign here of the new covenant they're giving them this sign of baptism to try to have some sort of assurance okay so in the fourth and fifth centuries we see different people coming up and more supporting infant baptism right we still have some people that are opposed to it right and the main one in the fourth and fifth century is augustine he is the probably the most formative early church father in all of church history some argue he's the most formative theologian in, in all of church history, period, not just the early church as well. He strongly held to infant baptism. So Augustine was the first one to make a parallel between circumcision and baptism. He made the argument that in the Old Testament, they circumcised young children, they circumcised babies, right? Male babies on the eighth day. So therefore, if that's the old covenant and now this is the new covenant, he starts to connect the dots and make the argument that, well, we should also give infants the sign of the new covenant. We should also baptize them as well. And now Augustine also really formed the doctrine of original sin. So in his mind, Augustine held very firmly that if an infant dies without baptism, they will not be in heaven. Because in his mind, he said, well, if you're born into sin, how can someone who has sin that is not that does not have faith, that is not cleansed, that is not paid for in his mind, how can that infant be in heaven? Because they have sin. And that's a question that we have to deal with, is the question of original sin with infants. So he held that they should be baptized in order to deal with that, in order for them to essentially go to heaven. He also held that it was still based on faith, but he, does, he held that the infant on their baptism had faith. And his reasoning for that was, is he had, if sponsors, whether the parents or the church, they could profess on behalf of the infant. And that profession would therefore be the profession of the infant in faith, and therefore they're being baptized based on the profession of their faith. Now, he left that door open. He didn't go much further than that. And it was because of that door being left open that the church, especially in the medieval period, really ran away from, or ran, they took this and ran with it essentially. And we're going to see this in the years from 1000 to 1200. We have a, a development of this doctrine. So the scholastic scholars around that medieval period, um, they started going with this idea that the church is believing on behalf of the infant. So they had to combine three things, babies, faith, and baptism. Three things that are very difficult to combine in a way that makes sense with the New Testament. So, right, as we said, Augustine proposed the idea of the faith of others, right? The church believes for the infant. So then who in the church does the believing? Is it the membership? Is it the congregation? Is it just the leadership, right? This, these, these are the thought process in the medieval period. And they said, well, the parents alone can't do it if it's the church. But what if the church is in error? How can a church that's in error believe on behalf of an infant? Well, then they decided, well, then it's the church in heaven, the believers in heaven, that believe on behalf of the infant. And then they come up with the thing, well, if it's the church in heaven, how does the church in heaven have faith? 
because you're in heaven, you don't need faith. Then they come up with the idea, well, it's based on the treasury of merits in the church in heaven. Because of their merits and their faithfulness, that can be imputed to the infant that's being baptized on behalf of the church in heaven. Therefore, the infant can still have faith. Right? So the medieval theologians, they sat around and thought through all of this different stuff, and it developed over time, as many things do. And then in about 1200, Peter Lombard became influential, and he started w coming up with the idea that it's not necessarily baptism based on faith, that the sins of the infant is actually washed away in the waters of baptism, that the act itself of baptism washes away your sin. Right? And that's a view that is summarized, you'll hear the words ex opere operato, which is in the operation or the act itself, that the remission of sins comes from actually getting baptized, so that the baby's actually having their sins washed away. And that started to become the majority view of the Roman Catholic Church at that point, was the idea that the act of baptism is washing away your sins, and it's based on the treasury of merits in the church in heaven. So as you can see, a lot of times, pedo baptists infant Baptist people, they will claim history. They will say, well, you Baptists, you've only been around for 500 years. Our doctrine's been held consistently for 1,500 years. As we can see, that's not the case. The doctrine of infant baptism has drastically transformed and changed in 1,500 years. Even what Augustine held was nothing close to what the Roman Catholics held in the year 1,500. It changed, it's transformed, and what the reformers held for infant baptism, as we're going to look at next, is drastically different than what the Catholic Church held. It keeps changing. So the doctrine of infant baptism that, say, Presbyterians hold today, right, is just as new, quote, new, as the doctrine of adult baptism from the Reformation period in the Anabaptists, because they're both new at that time. So Luther comes along, obviously Luther's a big fan of the Catholic Church, and nails and hammers. But anyways, he, Luther wanted to get away from this idea that the act of baptism washes away sins. So he started um, coming up with the idea of, it has to do with the word of, it's still the, based on the faith of the infant, but it has to do on the word of God being preached as well. How does the infant have faith? Luther says, well, if the gospel is preached at the baptism, and because the gospel, as Pastor Ryan said this morning, right, how can they believe unless they hear, and how can they hear unless there's a preacher, and what are they preaching? The gospel. So therefore, by hearing the gospel, even though the infant can't, you know, make words, but the, the infant hears the gospel, and therefore, the infant is still being baptized based on their faith, which comes from the word, right? So the, the faith is coming from the word, which is preached at the same time that the sacrament would be given, which is the sacrament of baptism. But he was really focused on, it must be the faith of the person being baptized. And you would think, well, if we're going to be consistent... They should profess their faith. And it seemed like Luther was moving into a spot of that only those should be that should be baptized are those who professed faith. But then we have the Anabaptists who come on the scene. And Luther, being typical Luther, doesn't know how to write in a moderate sense. Everything he writes is harsh. And he's just a man of extremes. That's just his personality. Um, so when he wrote against rebaptism, he says, whoever bases baptism on the faith of the one to be baptized can never baptize anyone. Since there is no difference in baptism, whether faith proceeds or follows, baptism does not depend on faith. So at this point, it's debated. Did Luther change his theology and backtrack towards Rome, to the Roman Catholic view, or was Luther just being a man of extremes, right? And this is debated all the time. We don't really know. It seems as if Luther started moving towards what would be an adult baptism, and then because of the Anabaptists, changed his theology and backtracked back towards Rome. Luther's early writings compared to his later writings are drastically different, especially when it comes to baptism, right? So why that happened, um, there's a lot of pressure at that time, right? And this brings us to the other reformers, two that we're going to focus on, Zwingli, and Balthazar Hubmeier, right, early Anabaptist guy. So Zwingli, who ended up killing Anabaptists, right, he said, oh, if you want to be rebaptized, well, we'll rebaptize you. And then they were drowned in the river. That was their second baptism, a baptism of death, right? There was one time long before that where Zwingli and Hubmeier were meeting at a river, and these guys were friends. Zwingli was friends with these early Anabaptist leaders. Um, and at that point, Basically, what we have from a story, right, we don't have Zwingli doing it. Zwingli didn't write much. He, was, he came out of the Catholic Church. He was actually a mercenary for the Catholic Church. 
And then when he was converted and started the Reformation in Switzerland, Zwingli fought against the mercenaries in the Catholic Church. So he was a pastor and also would draw his sword and fight the Catholics out on the battlefield. Right? So he didn't have a lot of time to write down a lot of his theology, so therefore he didn't because he was fighting the Catholics in the field with his sword. Um, but anyways, at this point, it's said that Zwingli agreed with Hubmeier that infant baptism should be rejected in their early years of their friendship. And then when the Anabaptist Revolution started coming along, Zwingli came to the point where he said, no, we shouldn't decide this. We should leave it up to the city council to decide what the truth is, whether it's infant baptism or whether it's adult baptism. Where Hubmeyer and the other early, early Anabaptists said, no, we need to look at scripture. Scripture needs to be our guide, not the city council. Remember at this time, separation of church and state was unheard of. Nobody did that, right? Other than heretics who were burned at the stake. That really didn't even come until the 1700s, 1800s, even in America. There are parts of America that, even after it was founded, that there wasn't religious liberty, right? Some of even the founding people said, absolutely not. Well, we have religious liberty in our country. So separation of church and state was unheard of. So Zwingli said, well, it's best to let the city council, who would also probably be elders within their church there in the city, decide this matter. And the Anabaptists said no, and that's when the divide happened. Zwingli himself claimed he said, all the doctors or all the theologians have been in error since the apostles, based on baptism. So as we can see, his doctrine of infant baptism is new. It's not old. He doesn't claim that it's old. He actually claims that it's new, and he's rediscovering something. And this was obviously in response to the Anabaptists, right? He was writing against them when he says this. And Zwingli really made the first covenantal argument that there is a covenant of grace that spans from the day Adam fell to the day Christ returns, and all people, all believers are under this covenant of grace, and the Old Testament and the New Testament are just different administrations of the same covenant. Therefore, if they had a household principle and they circumcised infants in the Old Covenant, and since we're under the same overall covenant, in the New Covenant, being the time we're in now, he would say, therefore, we should also baptize infants. He said it had nothing to do with the faith of the infant, which was different than Luther. And if it has nothing to do with the faith of the infant, and baptism is simply just a sign, right? It doesn't do anything for us. It's just a sign of faith or whatever. Then, well, why would you baptize infants? Therefore, he made the covenantal argument, right? This is the start of that covenantal argument for baptism being made. Where the Anabaptists were obviously very strong on people being baptized on the profession of faith. Now, within the Anabaptists, there's a bunch of different sides. There's a bunch of different groups. Um, not all Anabaptists are the same. You had the Anabaptists in Munster, which claimed that Munster was the new Jerusalem and that they were going to enforce it with the sword. Right? So you have radical Anabaptists. And then you have other Anabaptists that agreed with the Reformers on literally everything except for baptism. There's about six different groups um, of Anabaptists that were out there during that time. So, and now, this is where a misconception comes in. Many people think, well, we're directly from the Anabaptists because they're the adult bapti baptizers. It's not true. Unless you're a Mennonite or a Hutterite, you are not an Anabaptist. You did not come from them. They secluded themselves, right? Some of the Anabaptists went down south, which ended up being the Hutterites, right? Which my father-in-law was a Hutterite. He grew up and lived in a Hutterite community. They speak a dialect of German, right? And they still hold to their roots. And then you have the Mennonites, which were up north from Menno Simmons. And then because of some church discipline issue, the Amish ended up breaking off of the Mennonites early, right? So then, therefore, the only Anabaptists that are really left are the Amish, the Mennonites, and the Hutterites that have Anabaptist roots. American congregational or particular Baptists did not stem directly from the Anabaptists. So then we may ask, well, where did we come from? There's two main views. One is that it's called the Trail of Blood, which I'm not a fan of. I don't know a serious church historian that takes it seriously. Uh, but the Trail of Blood is the view that there's a hidden line of independent fundamental Baptist believers from the apostles they have, they, have two, they have a big chart, and it has this line up here, which is the corrupted church, which leads to the reformers in Rome and even some of the Anabaptists. And then we have this hidden line of Baptists that have believed just as we have for all 2,000 years. And somehow they come out during the Reformation period, right? That's called the trail of blood. There's no historical evidence for it. Um, ultimately, as much as we may not love it, we stem from the Presbyterians, right? John Smith 
was studying the Bible. He was, I think he was a professor at Cambridge for a while. He came to the conviction, right, uh, some different convictions than the Reformed Church at that time. Because of persecution, he went up to Amsterdam. And in Amsterdam, he came in contact with some liberal Mennonites at that point, right, that were kind of apart from where Menno Simmons would be himself. And because of some of that influence, he changed his views on infant baptism to adult baptism, but he didn't want to be associated with the Anabaptists, which is why shortly after him, they wrote the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which is just like the Westminster, which is the Presbyterian's confession. It's covenantal, right? It would be Calvinistic. And also, the only difference really is they hold to adult baptism. So they didn't want to be associated with the Anabaptists, so they wrote their own confession. And therefore, from that, an influence from the Puritans, a lot of the Puritans were what we would call Reformed Baptist at that point. Some of them are Presbyterians as well. They came and started to found different Baptist churches in England and in America, and that eventually morphed into what we have now today. So we still, and that's why we have so many branches of different Baptists today as well. Right? There's still Reformed Baptists that hold to the 1689. There's Particular Baptists. Right? There's, I mean, we could go on and on about the different groups of Baptists. But ultimately, we come from what would be the Reformed Church in our Baptist history with an influence from the Anabaptists. But we do not stem directly from the Anabaptists. So as we see, baptism changes a lot through her church history. So looking at our fifth point, which is um, paedo-baptism specifically with the Reformers. Right, obviously Zwingli didn't write a ton, but Calvin did write a ton. And they used the word sacrament. So we're going to define what does a sacrament mean. Right, so the Catholic Church's view of sacraments is different than what the Reformers held to what a sacrament was. Right, so Calvin defines a sacrament as it's an external sign by which the Lord seals on our consciences his promises of goodwill towards us in order to sustain the weakness of our faith. And we, in our turn, testify our piety toward him, both before himself and before angels as well as men. Testimony of divine favor towards us confirmed by an external sign with a corresponding attestation of faith. So his definition on sacrament, if we were to apply it based on what he said, should only be given to adults. Because it's based on our, our sign, our piety towards men and God before angels, and also with a corresponding attestation of faith. Right. So often we strafe, we don't like to use the word sacrament because we think, well, that means you're getting grace by doing the action. And that is the Catholic view. But the Reformed view of the sacrament, which is simply an external sign by which we're sealing our own consciousness, as Calvin says, and it's God's goodwill towards us. He's basically saying a sacrament is something that God has given towards us in which we can publicly profess our faith towards God and before men. That's a sacrament. Right? And based on that definition of a sacrament, I don't have anything against sacraments in the Reformed definition of it. In the Catholic definition, I have a whole lot against what they view sacraments as. Right? And they quote different things. Um, right? He quotes Augustine. He quotes um, Calvin quotes Chris, Chrysostom. He quotes early church fathers. Basically, the, in a general sense, God gave us physical bodies. We're not just spirits. And because God gave us physical bodies, he also gave us physical signs to confer spiritual things, right? What does baptism really confer? What is it a sign of? Well, our own immersion into Christ. What is the Lord's table a sign of? Christ's body and blood. They're physical signs of spiritual things, and ultimately that is what a sacrament is in its basic sense. So Calvin defines sacraments in one chapter. He then moves on to baptism, which we talked about last time, and he talks about Essentially, his definition of baptism is great. And then he moves on to his next chapter, which is infant baptism, which is wildly inconsistent with what he previously said. He talks about baptism being a sign of our faith, right? How it's, we're supposed to publicly attest our piety towards God through these signs, through these sacraments, which can't be done for infants. Um, and other people note this inconsistency, right? Karl Barth, you may have heard his name. He was really popular a while ago. Um, he had a lot of he transformed the church in America a ton through his works, but maybe not necessarily in the best way. But he said, how strange that Calvin seems to have forgotten this. Talking about his chapter on baptism. In his next chapter, where he sets out his defense of infant baptism, they're commending a baptism which is without decision and confession. He says, it's strange that Cal even these other theologians have noticed, it's strange that Calvin would state baptism this way, and then he would move on and basically disagree with himself in the next chapter. 
Right? So there's many theologians that have noticed this throughout the time, that Calvin's doctrine of baptism was inconsistent with his definition of baptism. Right? And he is what people would claim to be the father of right, the Presbyterian Church or the Reformed tradition as well. And he also made the covenantal argument that Zwingli made. So we see that paedo baptism is not ancient. It's new. Calvin's doctrine of baptism is not like the doctrine of infant baptism that was 1,500 years before him. It's drastically different. His, do his doctrine of baptism is just as new as ours. Right? I would claim ours is more ancient because we have the first two centuries, which they don't have. Right? And then it morphed from there on. So our sixth point, refuting some of the objections. So when it comes to objections to paedo baptism, they're making a covenantal argument. Right? Some of you may understand what covenantalism might be. Some of you may have not, um, because this church is dispensational, right? So we hold to a dispensational format of the scriptures, which primarily gets, ends up in our end times, right? But ultimately, uh, covenant theology is drastically different than dispensationalism. For us, the argument is simply, well, because the church is not Israel, and that's the Old Testament, that's the dispensational law, and now we're in the dispensation of grace, or the church age, therefore, why would we take anything from the Old Testament and reapply it to the New Testament? And it ends there. That's really as simple as it gets from a dispensational point of view. Now, Pado baptist people don't interact with that because they don't typically take dispensational people very seriously in their theology, typically because of the newness of it, right? Dispensationalism primarily came around in the 1800s by John Nelson Darby, right? There's seeds of it before that, but ultimately its full form didn't come around in the, until the past 200 years, right? So because it doesn't have that ancient backing that other things do, specifically the Reformed view of covenant theology, they would claim more of an ancient backing. So ultimately, if you're going to argue with a Presbyterian, your main argument is you're going to have to defend why dispensationalism is a better view than covenant theology. Because unless that is established, the argument doesn't even get to baptism because there's so much disagreement on the foundational level, right? So ultimately for you, brush up on your dispensationalism or whatever flavor or format you want to pick from because there's a lot of them, right? Because you're ultimately going to have to argue that on that foundation. So from the covenant side, right? And this is where most Baptists argue with Pado Baptist is on a covenantal argument, right? Because most Baptist scholarship comes from a covenantal side, from Reformed baptism. Um, but they state five things. So a Pado Baptist has five things that holds their theology together for why they baptize infants. And notably, none of it has to do with what the New Testament teaches, which you would think is a problem, right? So they work on, first of all, they defend covenant theology. They talk about the continuity of the covenant of grace, which is that covenant from Adam all the way to when Christ returns. And, because, and they would claim that there's one people of God. When did the church start? Well, the church started in the Garden of Eden. Right, the first believer. They claim that all believers are from all times as part of the church. They would not say, and this is where we need to be careful, they would not say that, is, or that the church has replaced Israel. A lot of times, and this is why they don't interact with dispensational people, is because we lob at them, well, you're replacement theologians. And then they roll their eyes and walk away because you've clearly, they say, they think you've clearly never read anything they've written. Because none of them claim that church has replaced Israel. They claim that Israel, there's only been one people of God right? It was called Israel in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's not that the church replaced them, but Israel was expanded to include the Gentiles within it, right? And they talk about that being the true Israel, as Romans 9 would state, or the spiritual Israel, as Galatians would say. They would go to those texts to defend that as well, right? And they would also claim whenever it talks about the assembly in the Old Testament, in the Greek translation, it is translated ecclesia, which is church, and they'd say see. In the Greek, it's the church in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So, Ultimately, they have the, a covenantal argument there. In the covenant of grace, they argue there's one people of God. Therefore, the old covenant sign should be applied just like the new covenant sign. Right? They talk about how this people of God stays the same. They talk about how the signs should remain the same. Circumcision in the Old Testament. Now it's baptism. That should be given to infants. And then also households. Households were circumcised in the Old Testament. There was a household idea and function in Israel. And they would say there's a household function in the New Testament. They would look at when the whole household was baptized, and they would claim that, well, that household must have included infants then as well. 
which is a drastic claim that I do not think can be made. Because a lot of those households, it claims, if you look at the text in Acts, that they believed, the house believed, and then they were baptized. How can infants believe? They can't. So therefore, those households could not have included infants within them. So we read the text from Jeremiah 31. And in this text, it talks about the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In the Old Testament, when someone sinned, it had household ramifications. Notice very carefully what it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 30. Everyone will die for his own iniquity in the New Covenant. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Jeremiah is indicating that there's a change in the household. We start out with this tribal argument, as the Old Testament functions with, that if the father sins, the whole house is cursed. Think of Achan, right? In the battle of Ai. They go in, they take over, he keeps some of the plunder for himself, which God said not to do, right? They find him out and all that stuff. And then what do they do with Achan? Do they just stone him? No, they stone him, his wife, his children, all of his possessions, and even the animals. Because the sin of the father also was imputed to the sin of the family as well. In the new covenant, as it says here, there's going to be a change. Each person dies for his own sin. The sin of the father will not be transferred. So we see in the substance of the new covenant here, there is not this tribal or household picture. There's an individual picture here. And if we look at the, um, towards verse... 34, right? They will not teach again, each man his neighbor, right? If you skip to the bottom, um, or I guess in the middle there, they will not say, no, the Lord, for they, will all, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Jeremiah states that when the new covenant comes, each person from the least to the greatest will know the Lord, right? Reform scholars and Pado baptists do not hold this because they would say, well, you baptize infants, you don't know if they're believers or not. We don't know if they're in the covenant, but we're going to put them into the covenant in a sense by baptism. They're giving a covenant sign to infants who they don't know is in the covenant yet. When it's clear in Jeremiah that everyone in the covenant must be a believer. Therefore, I would argue that the only reason you should give a covenant, you should never give a covenant sign to an infant. The covenant sign should only ever be given to those in the covenant. Well, and who's in the covenant? Verse 33, at the end, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Right? In Ezekiel, we have the aspect of the Spirit being put within them and causing them to walk in their ways. So those that are in the covenant are those who have the Holy Spirit, those whose the law is written on their hearts, and all of them know the Lord. That's only describing believers. So if we're going to work on covenant signs here, the old covenant sign of circumcision, yes, that was given to unbelievers because there were national and physical aspects to the covenant given to Abraham. The new covenant is not necessarily dealing with those physical aspects as the old was, right? There may be some to it, and that's debated and argued, but the substance of the new covenant is spiritual, and it's individual, and it's about a heart change. So therefore... It's perfectly fine that infants were given the old covenant sign of circumcision. I have no problem with that because that's what the Bible teaches and that's how it should be applied. But the new covenant sign of baptism should only be given to those within the covenant, which Jeremiah is extremely clear, and so is Hebrews, that those are only people who have their sins forgiven and those who know the Lord. So there is not a continuity between these covenant signs, right? There's not the continuity that these Pado baptist scholars are drawing from Old Covenant people to New Covenant people. We don't see that in the Old Testament, and we don't see that in the New Testament as well. Right? So ultimately, when it comes to the covenantal principle, I mean, we could spend weeks on covenant theology and working through that, and it gets complicated. But there's some good books right? that if you want more information, talk to Pastor Brian or talk to I, and we can get you some good books that will really work through some of these different arguments, more than what we have time for. So now let's work through the fun points. Who should baptize? Does it have to be the pastor? Well, what does scripture say? Well, it doesn't say. So here we have to make some judgment calls. It does not have to be a pastor who baptizes, but it is wise that it is a pastor, that it is a pastor who baptizes. Because if we're only baptizing believers, well, when people become members or baptized, who do they share their testimony with? The pastor. And then the deacons, they share their testimony with the leadership of the church. And then they determine whether there's fruit and whether there's a verifiable testimony that they're a believer. And then they go through and they share with the church, right? And then the vote happens and then they're baptized. 
okay? So it is wise to have a pastor baptized because the pastor is accountable for that person before God who's professing faith. And ultimately, the pastor and the spiritual leadership of the church would be the best at governing whether that person genuinely has the fruits of repentance and whether they should be baptized. Where some random person that has never met this person, yes, they could baptize them, but that probably wouldn't be wise because they don't know their life, they don't know their testimony, and they, the church doesn't know them as well. Right? So ultimately, who should baptize? I would make the argument that the pastor should, and you'd say, well, what about the Ethiopian eunuch? There's a, lot of, there's a few exceptions in, the, in Acts in the New Testament, but the exception is never the rule. That's something important we need to lay out. Right? When you're arguing for why baptism isn't necessary for salvation, we often go to the thief on the cross. But should the thief on the cross be our normative example? Should we all wait to the minutes before we're dead to profess faith in Christ? No, we shouldn't. So we're not going to make exceptions the normative example. They're there for a reason. Yes, there's exceptions. It's not always a pastor who baptizes, right? Not all Christians are baptized. We understand that, but that should not be the normative thing. So how should it be done? Well, immersion, right? That's the definition of, word, that, of the word. That's what the New Testament teaches. Um, it should not be pouring. It should not be sprinkling, right? We see... Um, how it's used in Acts, right? And we also see how it's used in Matthew and in the Gospels that baptism is done by immersion. When should baptisms be done? Basically, should they be private or should they be public? Right? This often comes up. Is it fine to have a private baptism, not before the church? Once again, the scriptures don't necessarily say. But what would be, I would think, the, the best precedent to set is that it would be a public thing. Right, Because this person is becoming part of the church, which is a public thing. Therefore, they should testify before the church. It's encouraging ch to the church to hear their testimony and to see their baptism. And also with the church present, we're also affirming as well that, yes, this person is being baptized into the faith, into our church. We are going to hold them accountable. Right? We are side by side with the new members that are being baptized into the church. Right? So it should be... I would argue that it should be done before the congregation, right, because of the accountability aspect. I mean, most of the people baptized within the book of Acts was a very public setting, and it was typically done by one of the leaders of the church. So we do have that precedent started, right? Whether it should be the start or end of a service, once again, the scriptures don't say. Um, the start is a good time. The end's a good time. The middle's a good time. I do think it should be part of a church service, though. It is an ordinance of the church. The Lord's Supper is for the church service. Therefore, baptism should also be part of a church service. I don't think it should be separate. I don't think, oh, well, we're going to have a separate baptism, you know, on this day. And, you know, there's going to be no preaching. There's going to be no devotion. We're simply going to, they're going to share their testimony. And then we're going to dunk them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? I don't think that's the best idea. Um, I think it should be connected with the church because it is a church ordinance. So how long to wait? How long should you wait after you're converted to be baptized? Right, this is a big question that typically if you have kids, kids who claim to be believers, this often comes up. If you don't have kids that are claiming to be believers, maybe you've never necessarily wrestled with this. Because in Acts, we see that they're baptized the same day they're converted. We see in the early church, in the first two centuries, they're starting to put some time in between somebody being converted and being baptized in order to teach them and to work with them about what life in a church looks like. So ultimately, in Scripture, we don't see a time period between conversion and baptism. So you could make that argument. But I do think it is wise, in a sense, to wait for a period of time, primarily because baptism, at least in my mind and in the mind of the New Testament, is entrance into the physical church. Therefore, we should give some time to work through what it means to be part of a church, how you can serve the church, how the church can serve you, what our doctrine is, what our covenant is, and then be baptized as a formal entrance within, to, within the church to become a member. Some people wait till the children are 18. Some churches hold that. Some will baptize children as young as six or seven. Right? It all depends on the pastor. It all depends on the church, on how long you should wait. I would advocate more on the younger side. I do not think it's helpful to the child's faith if they're a believer at seven years old and to wait 11 years because you're withholding them from church membership, you're withholding them from the accountability of the church, and you're withholding them from the Lord's table. And in my opinion, as we'll see next week, the Lord's table is an extremely important thing for your faith. And to withhold a believer from the Lord's table for 11 years, I think, could be detrimental to their faith. 
I think this could be part of a reason why children who grow up in the church and profess faith eventually walk away because they never become part of the church. They just become a tag on to their parents within the church body. They never serve. They're not really being served. They're just here for Sunday school or snacks. They profess faith and maybe their faith is genuine, but then when they come to making their own decisions because they never had a real connection with the church because they were never baptized and placed into the physical church, therefore they may walk away from the faith. And when people who walk away from their faith in their teen years, typically when they come back to the faith and they get serious, how they get serious about their faith, their first step is baptism and being part of a church. It's not always the case, but that is typically the case that we see with, with people. So I'm not arguing that you should always baptize your kids when they hit six years old and they say, I love Jesus, or saying Jesus loves me, but I do not necessarily think that we should wait long periods of time. I think children are essential to the church. I think they can serve the church in great ways, and maybe we as a church simply need to be better about how we use our kids under 18 that are members. That's something we could probably work on as a church. Right, but because maybe we're, if we're not doing a good job at that, that doesn't mean we should change what uh, the biblical teaching of baptism should be as well. So that's something that, we'll ha that ultimately as parents, you're going to have to consider. Right? Is your child showing genuine signs of repentance? Are they just sorry because they got caught and they are disciplined? Or are they genuinely repentant because they, they feel that they've sinned against God? As parents, you need to make that call in the home. Is your child just sorry because of discipline, or are they actually have a repentant heart? And if you can claim as a parent, yes, they're showing genuine signs of repentance, then we should start walking through some membership stuff. It may be your child should be baptized at that point, right? That's, a lot of that's going to be left up to the hands of the parent, and that includes discipleship at home on the parents. That includes family devotions. If those things are being neglected, how are you going to know whether your kid's growing spiritually or not? then how should they be baptized, right? Those are very important things. And a lot of it will land on the parents and specifically fathers in the household as heads of those households to be leading them, which is stated in our church covenant as well. So when it, the last, kind of our last question here, that we're in, actually we have two more quickly. Communion. Communion, just to briefly summarize, we'll talk about this more next week. Communion is an ordinance of the church, and I do not think an ordinance of the church should be given to somebody who's not in the church. Therefore, I would hold biblically, right, that people who are not baptized should not be partaking of communion, right? In 1 Corinthians 11, all these people Paul's speaking to are baptized believers. They're part of the church, and you have to examine yourself. If you examine yourself spiritually, right, and you're serious about it, that you're in the faith, well, first of all, why wouldn't you get baptized first and be part of a church, right? So if you're going to examine yourself spiritually, you should be baptized first, you should be part of the church, and then communion follows follows that and then our last aspect right should we accept baptisms from other churches if the church if they're baptized on the profession of their faith yes i don't necessarily care who baptizes them because baptism its efficacy is not tied in who baptizes them say pastor brian abandons the faith 10 years from now does that mean everybody he's baptized was not a true baptism now the answer would be no, because ultimately this was settled in the Donatist movement in early in church history, that it's not who baptizes that matters, but it's what they're baptized on. So if somebody is baptized on the profession of their faith in Christ alone, through faith alone, it's done by immersion, it's done in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, then I would say it's a valid baptism and it should be accepted. So for our applications, I think the applications to our study on baptism is pretty clear. If you are a believer who's professing faith in Christ, get baptized. Why are, why are you withholding yourself from the church? Why are you withholding yourself from the Lord's table? Right? If you're serious about your faith, why would you withhold yourself from being part of a church? Why would you withhold yourself from the first thing that Christ commands, the first thing all believers did in the book of Acts, which was water baptism by immersion? So consider that. Think. First of all, examine yourself. Are you in the faith? And if you are, are you baptized? If not, why? Why aren't you baptized? And if you say, well, I now understand I need to be baptized, well, then let's get baptized, right? Let's go through with it. Talk to Pastor Brian. Talk to myself. We'll work through this stuff, and we will move forward with bapt baptism. So ultimately, baptism has a great significance for our faith. It's a sign, right? You could even argue that it's a seal of our faith in a sense, it's something that benefits us spiritually. It enters us within the church. It helps us be accountable to one another. And I think it is something that greatly benefits not only the faith of the one being baptized, but also the faith of the church as well. It is something great for the church, 
It is something that's greatly neglected, even in Baptist churches today. Um, I think to our own spiritual detriment and to the detriment of many churches across America. Right? It's, a, it's time that we start taking baptism seriously again, just as the apostles did in the New Testament specifically. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful for the doctrine of baptism. We're thankful for the Lord's table, the ordinances that you've given us for our benefit. Lord, may we take it seriously. May we consider baptism. Uh, Father, if we're not baptized and we're believers, may we get baptized for our own benefit, spiritually and the benefit of the church. For those that are baptized, Father, I pray that they're serving in a church. Lord, that they would be faithful to their call, they would be faithful to their baptism and their public proclamation of who Jesus Christ is. Father, in our unity of the church, that we would be benefited. Lord, we look forward to our baptism service. May you bless it, and may you bless those who are being baptized on that day. Father, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, downstairs, there is ice cream and pie for Pastor Brian's birthday. And Clayton's birthday. But anyways, so feel free to stay, to join, and go eat some pie and ice cream. Thank you. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that. Thank you. Um, so just uh, two quick things. First of all, thank you, Pastor Wyatt. Now, that is a thorough teaching church history baptism. I love it. Like everything he's saying, it, it is right on. We need to know church history. And he makes it, I love it. He makes it come alive. He is, he is our, wow, resident church historian. Right on. I say amen to that. And secondly, if you are, in, so we have many people, we're trying to make it, get everybody appointments to talk with us and talk about baptism and membership. So if we have not yet made arrangements with you and you'd like to, let's find times. We'll meet. We'll come to your house. We'll visit. We'll talk. And then we'll, and then if you cannot make the August 8th, because many people are out of town, both for VBS and August 8th. So um, we can have another baptism. We can do as many baptisms as we want until the lakes freeze. So um, again, pick your time. But we, we can have multiple baptism services. August 8th isn't the only one we need to have. That's it, everybody. Thanks again, Wyatt. Wow, I love church history and the teaching on baptism. Praise